What do you observe in these two images? Uh, this lecture is about earthquakes, faults, and plate tectonics. Um, and, well, in both pictures, there is a fault scarp. And this is a uh, earthquake that took place in Montana in 1959. And the left side of each picture moved down in relationship to the right side. And so what happens in earthquake is it can uh, release pressure along a fault line and um, you get something like this. We have a little cartoon that I'll play that shows you what happens during an earthquake. The focus of an earthquake is where it occurs on the fault they be underground. The epicenter is the location directly above that focus on the surface of the ground. The fault scarp is what we just looked at where the, uh, it's actually the, the, the line of where the fault is. Fault trace is the uh, line on the earth that um, traces along where the fault is. Then you get seismic waves that are generated out from where the focus occurs and those travel through the ground and we'll be looking in this chapter about the different types of waves that come from a seismic wave. Let's go ahead and play this again. Play it again. You focus and here you have seismic waves being generated from that um, that slippage along the fault. So an earthquake, you can feel an earthquake because the seismic waves affect, affect us or affect a seismometer. Faults are represented, recognize, faults are recognized by observing offset of, offsets of features or changes in ele elevation of land surface. So on the left picture you have a line of trees that's offset by three meters in an earthquake in 1976 in Guatemala. In the middle picture you have a fence that offset by about three meters in San Francisco in 1906. And then in the right picture in the uh, Alaska earthquake of 1964 you had a vertical fault where you had one side sloping down, slipping down versus the other side. Here we have another um, little video that shows earthquakes in motion. Let me go ahead and play it. A fault, you have a focus, seismic waves come from the focus, epicenter is directly above the focus on the surface of the earth. By the way, it's important to know that. That'd be a good test question. And you have the fault scarp on the surface of the earth where um, it's along the plane of the fault. So what is a fault? Well, a fault is a fracture in the crust on which movement has occurred. It's a zone of weakness where earthquakes occur. It's a location. A focus is the location where the movement begins on a fault. Epicenter is the location the surface, on the surface above the focus. A fault scarp is a step of land surface formed by movement on the fault. And only part of a fault typically breaks during an earthquake. It, doesn't, it usually breaks in pieces. There's a question. An earthquake occurred in the Erie Fault five kilometers beneath San Gabriel. Damage from the earthquake was greatest in nearby Fremont. The furthest report of shaking was reported in Stockton. Where was the earthquake's epicenter? Well, that was at the Erie Fault because the earthquake occurred on the Erie Fault um, beneath San Gabriel. The epicenter is the spot directly above the focus. This is where the earthquake took place. We have another one of these cool cartoons here. By the way, if the cartoon doesn't play when you're listening to this, you can right-click the cartoon and click play. So, if the if the cartoon doesn't play, right-click it and click play. And if the others haven't played, you can back up and, and go play those. 
So here we have a normal fault and it erodes. Here we have Horst and Graben, where you have land pulling apart and you have normal faults on both sides of that. So these are what we call normal faults, or where the you have land that pulls apart and then other land slipping down because it gets pulled apart. There's three types of faults. Faults are classified by relative movements of rocks on either side of a fault surface. A normal fault is a block where uh, one side moves down in relationship to the other. A, a reverse fault, on the other hand, is when one side uh, moves up in relation to the other. So you have compressive, um, compressive forces pushing the land together with reverse faults. And, um, and strike-slip faults are where a fault plane um, moves horizontally left or right compared to the other plane, other side. Okay, what type of fault generated that fault scarf we looked at earlier? Well, it would have been a normal fault because one side slipped down below the other in comparison to the other. The San Andreas Fault, um, we got a picture of it here. It's the boundary between the North American and Pacific plates. And here you have a picture in the middle of a stream that's going down from the northwest to the southeast. It hits the fault scar, it moves to the left, and then keeps on going. And uh, the, the real picture, the cartoons in the middle, the real picture is on the lower left. So you have a stream running from the northwest to the southeast, hits the fault scar, moves to the left, and then keeps on going. Okay, fault movements are driven by stresses produced by plate tectonics. And uh, you, you can have lots and lots of faults on the edges of plates. So don't, don't think of the edge of a plate as one big fault. It's lots and lots of faults along that. There's friction along the fault that causes it to stick. If you put something that, like put your hands together and kind of push them together and then try and move them, they don't, and then suddenly they'll jerk. Well, that's the sign of thing you get with a with an earthquake. Put your hands together and kind of push them together and they're sticky. Then with the pressure toward each other, now try and pull them apart and then they bounce. Well, that's what happens with an earthquake. Okay, there, along a fault, there's a recurrence interval of how often you'll get an earthquake. Sometimes it's hundreds of years, sometimes it's decades or less. And you can measure the pressure along a fault to try and predict, not very well, when an earthquake is going to occur. Scientists aren't very good at predicting when earthquakes occur. Because it's just really hard to figure out. Well, this is a really interesting uh, series and you got a good picture in your book so I'd, I'd recommend you look at the picture in your book but along this fault in northern Turkey in different time different um, different times in history over over decades over a hundred years or so you get different parts of the fault that are breaking and causing earthquakes lots of earthquakes in Turkey and um, along that North Anatolian fault pieces of it will break at different times and create earthquakes along that fault. Okay, well here's a good picture of it. So in 1999 in the far west that part broke. Um, before that, 1992 in the far east, that part broke. Um, before that, let's see, 1967, kind of almost to the far west, that part broke. And then 1957, a little further east from that. In the middle, 1951. So you get the idea. Each of these pieces broke at different times. So don't think of one big fault all is breaking all at once they break in little pieces. So here's a question. If the San Andreas Fault moves 500 kilometers per big earthquake, 500 centimeters per big earthquake kilometers, that would be a big movement. There'd be a movie out of that one. Um, 
It moves five centimeters per big earthquake and the fault movement is equivalent to plate motion of 2.5 centimeters a year. How many years of plate motions must accumulate to produce one big earthquake? Well, 200 years, because um, that's how many centimeters times 2.5 centimeters times 200 equals 500. Okay, well here's where we see the earthquakes around the world. Um, there's a distribution of earthquakes right along plate boundaries. Right, right along divergent plate boundaries you get a lot of shallow earthquakes and convergent plate boundaries you get deeper earthquakes. So here's an example of a convergent plate boundary where you have one crust um, subducting underneath another crust. And so you have earthquakes, not just at the surface, like you might at the, at the oceanic ridges, but um, on down deep under the earth as that crust dives down below other crust and starts to melt. Here's a question. What are the deepest, where are the deepest earthquakes most common? Well, like we've talked about, they're most common at subduction zones because that's where one plate is diving down beneath another plate because the plates are pushing together. Now, at mid ocean ridges, they're pulling apart, so the earthquakes are shallow, and at transform boundaries, they're also shallow because the um, boundaries, the, 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 the land that we'd feel where it's pulling um, next to each other would, be, would not be way down deep. Okay, where are earthquakes distributed? Well, the largest earthquakes are found at convergent plate boundaries, which are circled in red, where most of those are. There's, there's other places, but that's where most of the convergent plate boundaries are. Now the question, why are there potentially large earthquakes in Oregon and Washington? Well, that's a subduction zone, and the reason you have the uh, volcanoes like Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens and uh, the volcanoes in Oregon and Northern California and Washington is because you have a plate diving down beneath another plate and it's melting and creating volcanoes there on the west coast of the U.S. But the largest earthquakes are found at convergent plate boundaries. What foci pattern would occur for an oceanic plate subducting to the east beneath a continental plate? Now you got to be a little careful here because um, uh, are we looking south, are we looking north, are we looking east, are we looking west? Well, um, if, if, we, if we pretend the east is to the right, so north is to the top of our slide, and we don't mix ourselves up, then um, we'll say that's to the east. But if I turn this around and make north to the bottom of your slide, then that would be the west. Um, so just be really careful with um, the test questions and think about south maybe to the, to the bottom of your page, maybe to the top of your page, and so you're going to have to put your head in 3D space to be able to answer this kind of question. But if foci will deepen, um, just as the uh, plate subducts beneath another plate. Okay, most of the large U.S. earthquakes are up in Alaska. Most of the earthquake damage is in California because that's where most of the people live as compared to Alaska. How consistent is earthquake activity? Well, um, look at 2005 compared to 2004, and they're pretty consistent, kind of the same place. Okay, so here's a question. The figures below show the location of a plate boundary, which is the dashed line. So the dashed line is a plate boundary on each of the A, B, C, D, or E. And the distribution of the earthquake foci are the dots, or the filled circles. The color of the filled circle indicates the depth of the earthquake. So black is the shallowest, blue, then next, then green, then red are the deepest earthquakes. So which, which figure best illustrates a convergent plate boundary between oceanic and continental plates? Well, convergent would be coming together. So you'd have a trench, which means you'd have 
Um, no earthquakes in one plate and earthquakes getting from shallower to deeper in the other plate. So first of all we can get rid of A and D because they have earthquakes in both plates. So those, those wouldn't count. And we can get rid of E because the, the deep and shallow earthquakes are all mixed up. And um, we can get rid of B because the deep earthquakes are right along the plate boundary, so the answer must be C. Earth Science, uh, chapter on earthquakes. In, the, in this lecture, we're going to focus on seismic waves and earthquake detection. Seismic waves are the reason we can feel earthquakes. Uh, they're vibrations caused by an earthquake. They travel in all directions from, from the focus, not from the epicenter, from the focus, which remember is, is most, mostly underground. And they're recorded on an in instrument called a seismograph. And then the seismogram is the printed record of the seismograph. So a seismograph is the instrument, or a seismometer would be the meter that measures it. Seismograph creates the graph, and a seismogram is a printed record from this seismograph. Seismo uh, is the word for seismic waves, earthquake waves. So here's a picture of a uh, seismograph, and it's got a pen, and the pen stays in one place, and the paper underneath it moves around because the paper is attached to a drum, which is attached to a big, heavy, um, con piece of concrete and metal which is then attached to the floor which is then attached to the ground. And here's a picture of a um, seismograph. So you have a uh, rock ground movement and then a pen moving um, with the ground. Notice that there's different waves, and that's what we're going to focus on here. You get P wave and an S wave, and then a surface wave or an L wave. Okay, this is one of those things where you have to right click and click play. And so it's going to move up and down. Again, right click, click play. The ground moves up and down, and the pen stays in one spot. There's two forms of seismic waves. Um, there's the slower surface waves that travel along the Earth's surface. You can see a picture in green of those surface waves. And then there's the faster body waves that travel through the Earth's interior. And there's two types of body waves. There's the S waves and the P waves. Um, P waves are compressional. They push back and forth, whereas S waves, um, as you can see, they're squiggly. It's little squiggly lines, but they, they, they travel more like a sine, a sine curve. In other words, they, they don't just go back and forth, they go sideways. Here we have a picture of um, particle motion of the two types of waves. And here we have picture okay so I'm going to do the little right 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 click click play again thing so now we have a P wave which is a compressive kind of a wave we have an S wave which is a particle motion sideways like a sine wave then we have a love wave or an L wave, which is going sideways, and then a Rayleigh wave. But these are both types of surface waves, and um, they travel along the surface of the ground. The uh, slinky is a good way to um, to use to seeing these kind of waves because a slinky, you can see the particle motions compress back and forth, and so the um, Slinky analogy is a really good one for compressing back and forth. Uh, the rope analogy is a really good one for 
uh, secondary or shear waves because you wiggle the rope sideways and then you can see that wave propagation go all the way up in the rope and then even bounce back in that but by the way, uh, S waves cannot pass through liquid. P waves can only pass through liquid. So now that's important because in a little bit we'll talk about um, how S waves can't go through the outer core because it's liquid. That's how we know it's a liquid because S waves do not go through it. Here's a seismogram getting created. Let's go ahead and play this and click play if this doesn't work in your machine. And here we have a P wave generated, S wave generated, a surface wave. And over time, those waves are coming through the earth and eventually hit that seismograph. Notice they hit the seismographs at different times. So play that again and notice the point of this is that um, you get two different stations and um, depending on the time, um, each station will get a, a, um, an earthquake wave coming to it. So you can tell how far an earthquake, uh, earthquake is from the station and then triangulate from different three different stations or multiple different stations to know exactly where that earthquake took place. There's two types of surface waves, Rayleigh waves and love waves. And these surface waves are responsible for much of the earthquake damage. Rayleigh waves um, move up and down vertically, and surface waves move side to side. Well, suppose you were near an epicenter of an earthquake and felt the earth move as if you were in an ocean. What type of seismic wave would you have experienced? Well, you would have experienced a Rayleigh wave, because remember, that's the up and down kind of motion you get on the surface. The time it takes for seismic waves to reach a seismograph station increases with the distance from the focus. And I had a little cartoon of this earlier. In case you missed that or it didn't work, this shows the same thing. That the um, seismograph A is closer to the focus of the earthquake than the seismograph B. And so the, the um, seismogram looks different. The time lag is longer for seismogram B than it is for A. And so the time interval um, is, is longer for B than A. And you can use those time, time lags to tell the distance to an earthquake. Here you have an example of Lima being a lot further from the focus of the earthquake or the epicenter of the earthquake than Denver. And so the interval between when the P waves hit, the, the P waves travel faster than the S waves. When the P waves hit the seismogram, um, they, they get there a lot faster than in Denver than they do in Lima. And it takes longer for the S waves to get to Lima than in Denver so that the interval is longer. So you can use this interval to know how far away the earthquake is and if you have three different seismographs then you can use that to triangulate um, and get the location of an earthquake. Uh, data from multiple, so here's an example of that data from multiple seismogram stations is needed to seismograph stations is needed to pinpoint a location of an earthquake and so you you, um, you should get your compass out and and uh, draw a uh, diameter or a certain or a uh, uh, get your compass out and draw a circle with a radius coming out of Lima a radius coming out of Denver and a radius coming out of St. John and the three circles meet at um, it looks like about Vancouver. Examine the seismogram below that shows a 26 minute long record of, of the seismogram, seismic waves from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake as it was received by a seismograph station in Germany over 14,000 kilometers away, which letter represents the first arrival of the 
the arrival of the first S waves. Well, that would be D. You can tell P waves from an S waves. A would be the P wave. S waves are um, have a much higher amplitude than a P wave. Approximately how much time elapsed between the arrival of first S and P, P and S waves? Um, the seconds are at the bottom, so uh, about 800 to about 1400. 1400 minus 800 is about 600 seconds, so about 10 minutes. Um, earthquake size can be determined by measuring the amplitude or height of a seismic wave and here are the equations take into account for distance and materials so you can see amplitude for the surface waves there and here's an example of a P wave as compared to an S wave on a seism seismograph And um, so there you have the P and S with surface waves. And here we are showing this triangulation where you have different radiuses. Two radiuses, you don't know which of the two um, it is. It could be one or the other. Of course, you could phone and find out who had who felt the earthquake, but it's better to get a third one, just get another radius, and you can tell the difference. So the earthquake took place right where the star is. One unique use of seismic waves is, is to detect when nuclear weapons are fired, and um, it's a very different type of a wave, but they show up just like any other earthquake. Also to monitor volcanic activity. You can tell what's happening with the magma chamber as it's moving um, around. Or you could, um, if you remember that S waves don't go through liquid, so you could find out where the magma is and um, detect. So if, if you if you if you fire off the explosion on the left side and then measure it on the right side of this volcano, um, you would not see any S waves um, because um, they would have stopped by not going through the liquid magma. Explore the Earth's interior. Um, waves will go through the Earth's interior, but you only get P waves um, going through the outer core because the outer core is liquid. A large earthquake occurred along the fault was recorded at a seismograph station 300 kilometers away. The next day a smaller earthquake occurred at the exact same location of the fault. Which statement is most accurate? Well C, the P waves would have taken the same time to reach the station after each earthquake. Um, it's a smaller earthquake but they would have traveled at the same speed. An earthquake occurred in the Erie Fault five kilometers beneath San Gabriel. Damage from the earthquake was great, greatest in nearby Fremont. The furthest report of the shaking was recorded, was recorded in Stockton. Where was the earthquake's epicenter? At the Erie Fault, right at the epicenter. Here we have a Venn diagram and so surface waves are the most damaging, P waves are the first to arrive, surface waves are the last to arrive, um, P and S waves are both body waves, surface waves or Rayleigh waves are a type of surface wave, um, P waves travel four to six kilometers a second in the crust, that, that's an average, and uh, S waves are the second waves to arrive, Love waves are type of surface waves. Um, the, in P waves, the particles move back and forth in the same direction as the wave. Um, all three waves are generated at the time of an earthquake. Um, surface waves are on the Earth's surface, and all three waves are used to determine the earthquake's magnitude.
Earth Science, Earthquakes, and this lecture is going to be about earthquake hazards. Um, in the 20th century, more, more than tw 2 million people were killed by an earthquake. 30 million U.S. citizens live in an earthquake hazard zone, and lots of deaths are due to building collapses or from tsunamis and earthquakes. Um, the Indian Ocean tsunami recently um, claimed um, 230,000 people. The 2004 tsunami, which we were just talking about, um, took place off the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. And it, the tsunami was felt worldwide. There was not an ocean that didn't feel a piece of the tsunami. And it's a case where you have one plate subducting under another plate and it buckled. And when it buckled, it pushed a layer of water up and that layer of water proceeded to travel around the earth. Here's a little cartoon showing how that happens. Fault displacement of the ocean floor displaces large volumes of water. Um, it often happens at a subduction zone. It moves fast. Um, the water then um, the water moves fast once this happens, and um, low waves on an open ocean can pile up when the when they hit this um, a, a shoreline and um, get really to a really big wave when it hits the shoreline. So here's an example. Okay, so how long did it take the Indian Ocean tsunami to reach India? Well, it took two hours. There wasn't hardly any warning. Africa took 7 to 11 hours, South America 29, 20 hours, and North America 29 hours. But it did reach, did reach. And the wave heights in Sumatra got up to 30 meters high. 30 meters. That's really high. It's taller than the trees in my backyard. Um, so here's an example of the kind of tsunami damage. The waves just plowed into the ground, into the side of the, of the ocean there. It's hard to imagine just how devastating a tsunami is. Here's a picture of a, a city before the tsunami and after the tsunami. It just wiped out the town. The power of water is just incredible. Here's another picture before the tsunami. So we're talking about a 30 meter, 100 foot high tsunami coming through here. And there it is after, just nothing left. Wow. Okay, there was an earthquake, um, the Tokuru earthquake in 2011. And here's the height of the tsunami um, from this 9.0 magnitude earthquake. It's a big thrust. It's blinking there in the middle of the picture. And um, it wiped out a nuclear power plant, and there's still problems coming from that. We, it's worth reading up a little more about that because um, that type of hazard is pretty scary. Here's the kind of devastation from that tsunami from the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. There's some really good YouTube videos of people watching from a top of a building, watching this water just come right through the town. Wow. That was a beautiful city at one time. That Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in 2011 was spread right across the Pacific Ocean. And here you can see the, the tsunami heights as it came across the Pacific Ocean. Um, 120 centimeters or about a, a meter and a half high, close, and then um, right across the Pacific Ocean it stayed pretty high all the way to South America. Um, you can see tsunami deposits from tsunamis in the past. Um, here's one from 
1700. Cascadia. There's fire pits in this site used by Native Americans with topsoil and then sand deposited by the 1700 tsunami above that. In another uh, lecture I had mentioned a book called 1434 and a company book called 1421. The book's actually numbered that way. It talks about a year and he, he suggests that um, the Chinese fleet was wiped out in 1451 and you can see he says in there pasted on the side of mountains on the edge of New Zealand Chinese junks way up on the side of the mountain because the tsunami blasted them in the side of that mountain. Oh, it would be interesting to go look. Um, here's some earthquake um, damage, earthquake hazards, tsunami heights along Japan. Uh, <clears throat> here's some uh, um, stats about water levels both above and below uh, from tsunamis. Okay, so that's tsunamis. Now let's talk about other earth types, uh, earthquake hazards. Here we're in California and we're looking at um, damage from faults along uh, the California fault system. And um, here we have the red are severely damaged buildings um, and the um, um, the hash marks are a strong ground shaking the orange is in numerous landslides so you can see all kinds of hazards you get in California because of the uh, you know, north, north and northwest of Los Angeles um, because of that earthquake system. Strong a magnitude of 6.7 Northridge earthquake was the most recent to strike in developed area in that part of California. Um, one of the things that happens with um, an earthquake is ground shaking gets exaggerated with weak earth materials and so you get a bridge that's over um, it's not over rock, it might be over soft mud, sand, or gravel. And so that makes the earth bounce up and down a lot stronger than it would be if it's over rock. And um, unfortunately, there were some cars underneath that top layer and are probably still there when they took this picture. So um, you had one top bridge just crash down on top of another bridge and there's a man standing there you can see. Um, landslides are common when steep slopes um, are shaken and so here you have a house in California that's built next to a steep slope. It's really pretty but boy you have a problem with um, an earthquake and that house just headed on down the hill. What a tragedy. Somebody was living there and they just lost their house everything in it. Um, here's an interesting picture here because these are tree stumps in Sumatra that were originally on dry land and they were broken off by the Indian Ocean tsunami and in addition they were on dry land and the um, and uh, the fault dropped the land level down so not only did the trees break off but the land dropped down and see so the elevation is lower so now it's under sea level. Um, one thing that can happen with earthquakes is the um, land can liquefy and this is an example of some buildings in Japan where the land liquefied and the, the, whole, the whole apartment building just fell over because the, the, um, um, the, the, the dirt turned into a liquid because of the shaking. Um, find stands of dead trees. You might might look for um, past earthquakes in the, that, that um, we can see evidence of. And here's a couple. Here's an example. You can see a stand of dead trees in a coastal marsh in Washington State. It was killed off by a past earthquake. 
and um, if you do radiocarbon dating of these trees in Washington you can see that they died in 1680 to 1720 from a perhaps a past earthquake we're not sure but um, might have been uh, mega earthquakes are normally found along subduction zones so yeah we have a lot of earthquakes in California but the big earthquakes happen during subdu around subduction zones and that's where these tsunamis come from is around subduction zones um, we saw the picture of Cascadia earlier and that tsunami deposit um, you also see a tsunami deposit from 1960 down in Chile and you can see that sand that sand deposit over topsoil um, you can use tree ring analysis to uh, to find ghost forest trees that um, died in the past. Um, one of the one of the reasons this is important to do is to find out just what kind of earthquakes have occurred somewhere in the past, and if you can decide that, then you can help influence building codes. Because if you know that a big earthquake is going to happen then you might want to have the uh, people that decide what kind of buildings you can. skyscrapers are built in Seattle um, build those to a different code than you would otherwise so it's really important to know what kind of hazards are uh, possible uh, so that you can um, keep people safe in a city like Seattle which point in the graph below is most likely a mega earthquake so you have vertical earthquake magnitude, in other words how big the earthquake is, and the horizontal axis is how often it occurs, interval in years. Well the big earthquake is a mega earthquake and it would not occur very often. Two methods are used for measuring earthquakes, magnitude and intensity. It's important to know the difference between these two. Well, magnitude is a standard measure of the shaking and or energy release from an earthquake. And intensity is the measure of the effect of an earthquake on people and buildings. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difference. And it's important to know the difference between magnitude and intensity. Magnitude is measured on a logarithmic scale. And each division on the logarithmic scale is a tenfold increase of ground motion. And each division is 32 times bigger than the other division. So, for example, a magnitude 5 earthquake exhibits 100 times more shaking and releases 1,000 times more energy. Here are some examples of um, magnitude. Um, you have lots of small earthquakes, not very many big earthquakes. Magnitude of two, you have about a million of the magnitude two earthquakes here. You have um, maybe one magnitude nine earthquake a year. And every now and then you get a magnitude 10 earthquake. How much ground motion would increase between a magnitude 4.5 and 5.5 earthquake? 10 times as much because remember when you go magnitude of one difference it's 10 times um, the ground motion. Okay, let's talk about intensity. We we're talking about magnitude, now we're talking about intensity. Well, intensity uses what's called a modified Mercalli scale. And um, what you're doing, what you're looking at, mag at intensity is basically looking at what damage occurred and, and giving it a um, number based on the amount of damage. So number one is not felt by people, whereas number 12 and notice their Roman numerals. It's total damage, objects are thrown into the air, rides, bed, rock, rock slides, and slope failure. So intensity, obviously you'd have a higher intensity if you're closer to the earthquake. 
further away from the earthquake, you'd have lower intensity. And so um, mag magnitude would be the same regardless how close you are to the earthquake, whereas intensity would be different because it's basically how it feels or how much damage occurs. Okay. Um, depending on the population density, building codes, ground materials, or distance, um, the intensity might be a little bit different. Okay, so here we are in California again, that same area where we looked at before. And this is the kind of intensity we get on a typical earthquake in that area. Um, these are the areas where we'd have significant earthquakes could occur. Um, notice in um, northeast Arkansas, you have the New Madrid Fault area, and you can have some quite intense earthquakes in that area. Notice in central Oklahoma, you can also, um, just because there, there are some earthquakes that occur um, in the Midwest. Most of the earthquakes in the United States occur in the West Coast, but there are some in the Midwest also. So three sites, L1, 2, and 3, recur earthquake magnitude and earthquake intensity for the same earthquake. L1 is located closest to the focus and L3 furthest away. Where is intensity the greatest and what happens to the earthquake magnitude calculated at different sites? Well, the answer is A. Intensity is greatest at L1 because it's the closest and magnitude is the same at each site. Because remember, magnitude doesn't matter where you're located. Intensity um, is only important based on how close you are to the earthquake.